Michael Shermer is founding publisher of Skeptic Magazine, writes for Scientific American. Yeah. I do. Uh, was a college professor, still teaches some stuff at uh, Claremont Graduate University. His recent, most recent book is The Mind okay. of the Market. All right, thank you, Roger, and, um, and Rob Zepps and the Zepps family for sponsoring this and bringing me in. Uh, this is my third Beyond Belief, so there's been three. I guess that makes it a streak. Uh, at the first two, um, we talked a lot about religion, and uh, I'm a, mostly a science activist, although I've been drawn into this. Uh, I guess it's a little bit like crossing an uh, atheist with a Jehovah Witness is somebody who knocks on your door for no reason at all, and I seem to be doing a lot of that uh, lately. At any rate, um, the general consensus seemed to be here in the, in the first two that, um, that religion is a serious problem. In fact, there was this idea that if we could just get rid of religion and the delusion of believing in God, that uh, that would eliminate most wars and revolutions and conflicts and intolerance and bigotry and the like, the imagine no religion scenario. And I think that's just a bit too easy, a little simple. Simplified, I think in most instances, religion tends to be an excuse for land grabbing, power mongering, political machinations, economic manipulations. Uh, I think you can remove the excuse uh, and another one would quickly fill the void. Uh, so Marxism, for example, is a 20th century faux religion, uh, which does just a, a, as effective a job as, as religion does. As well, more recently, nationalism, both political nationalism and economic nationalism, I think, is just as dangerous. So um, I think the problem is not religion. The problem is tribalism. We're a social primate species, and as such, we're exceptionally tribal. Group identity is essential to our sense of self. And although, yes, there's religious uh, tribalism, there's economic and political tribalism. And the unfortunate byproduct of this is that we are pretty uh, xenophobic. We have a natural aversion to others, and we show a remarkable ability to sort people into in-group, out-group categories on practically any criteria, the Crips and the Bloods, the Hutus and the Tutsis, the Albanians and the Serbs, the Shiites and the Sunnis, or more recently and closer to home, the conservatives and the liberals. <laughs> so the tropes are pretty familiar. Um, conservatives, as you know, are stingy, heartless, dour, dim-witted authoritarians who appeal to voters' emotions through threat and fear-mongering. Conservatives, we're told, they avoid uncertainty. They have a need for order, structure, and closure. Conservatives are resistance to change, and they endorse inequalities. Of course, conservatives know all about liberals. Liberals are a bunch of sandal-wearing, tree-hugging, whale-saving, hybrid-driving, trash-recycling, peacenik, flip-flopping bedwetters. Liberals, say conservatives, lack a moral compass that leads to an inability to make clear ethical choices. And in, they have an inordinate lack of certainty about many social issues. Liberals have a pathological fear of clarity that leads to indecisiveness, a naive belief that most people, virtually all people, are equally talented and a blind adherence in the teeth of contradictory evidence that culture and environment determines one's lots in society. And therefore, it's up to the government to remedy all social injustices. To pace Richard Dawkins, I call this the government delusion. <laughs> so anyway, I think we can move beyond such obvious oversimplifications of both liberals and conservatives. Um, and I think we should adopt the approach that uh, considers liberals and conservatives as emphasizing different moral values. I, I wasn't here yesterday, so um, Jonathan, I don't know if you emphasize this, but I like uh, Jonathan Heath's approach that, uh, quote, morality is not just about how we treat each other, as most liberals think. It is also about binding groups together, supporting essential institutions, and living in a sanctified and noble way. When Republicans say that Democrats just don't get it, that's the it to which they refer. So conservative positions on gays and guns and God must be understood as a means to achieve this kind of moral order in society. Anyway, I think ever since 9-11, um, it's become clear that other tribes are dangerous, really dangerous. They're not rational. You can't just sit down and reason with them. 
And I think that's a threat that conservatives understand or at least take more seriously than liberals appear to. It reminds me a little bit of Rob Reiner's 1992 uh, film, A Few Good Men, uh, in which Jack Nicholson's character, the battle-hardened Marine Colonel Nathan R. Jessup, is being cross-examined by Tom Cruise's naive rookie Navy lawyer, Lieutenant Daniel Caffey. Caffey is defending two Marines accused of killing a fellow soldier named Santiago. He thinks Jessup ordered a code red, an off-the-books command to rough up a lazy Marine trainee in need of discipline and that matters got tragically out of hand. Caffey wants answers to specific questions about the incident. Jessup wants to lecture him on the meaning of freedom and the need to defend it. The ensuing dialogue includes Jessup's penetrating testimony about the true nature of human nature. Come on, Jessup! Did you order the code red? You don't have to answer that question. I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Son, we live in a world that has walls, and those walls have to be guarded by men with guns. Who's gonna do it? You? You, Lieutenant Weinberg? I have a greater responsibility than you can possibly fathom. You weep for Santiago and you curse the Marines. You have that luxury. You have the luxury of not knowing what I know. That Santiago's death, while tragic, probably saved lives. And my existence, while grotesque and incomprehensible to you, saves lives. You don't want the truth because deep down in places you don't talk about at parties. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. We use words like honor, code, loyalty. We use these words as the backbone of a life spent defending something. You use them as a punchline. I have neither the time nor the inclination to explain myself to a man who rises and sleeps under the blanket of the very freedom that I provide and then questions the manner in which I provide it. I would rather you just said thank you and went on your way. Otherwise, I suggest you pick up a weapon and stand a post. Either way, I don't give a damn what you think you are entitled to. Did you order the code red? I did the job. Did you order the code red? You're goddamn right I did. <laughs> One of the great moments in movie history. <laughs> so um, the simple observation that we live in a world with walls and have for 6,000 years of recorded history implies, obviously, the walls are needed. The constitutions of states have yet to alter the constitutions of man. So maybe we should try something different. I got to thinking about this uh, type one civilization when I was, um, that is what we can move toward that is somehow different from uh, politics and economics, tribal politics and tribal economics as usual. Um, in a uh, 1964 article on uh, searching for extraterrestrial intelligences, the Soviet astronomer Nikolai Kardashev suggested using radio telescopes to detect energy signals from other possible civilizations, and he typed them, just to different, looking for different types, like a type one civilization, for example, controls the energy of its sun, a type two civilization controls the energy of an entire star, sorry, planet star, and then a type three galactic civilization controls the energy of an entire galaxy. Presumably, the signals you would find would be different for these kinds of civilizations. And we're somewhere between a type zero and a type one. 70, 1973, Sagan calculated we were about a 0 0.7 uh, civilization, still burning dead plants and uh, oil and coal as a, as a primary energy source. So I got to, to thinking that uh, we could kind of reconfigure the evolution of human culture using this typography, a type one being simply fusion, fission fusion groups of primates, a point two of bands of roaming hunter-gatherers that were um, pretty much of a horizontal political system, an egalitarian economy. Point three, tribes of individuals linked through kinship with a more settled and agrarian lifestyle. Uh, the beginnings of political hierarchy and a primitive economic division of labor. Uh, chiefdoms consisting of a coalition of tribes and bands into a single hierarchical political unit a dominant leader at the top, the beginnings of significant economic inequalities and a division of labor in which lower class members produce food and other products consumed by non-producing upper class members. 
Type point five, the state is a political coalition with jurisdiction over a well-defined geographical territory and its corresponding inhabitants with a mercantile economy that seeks a favorable balance of trade in a win-lose game against other states. 